Falling in love for the first time is one of the most intoxicating experiences that you can have in your life. For most people, that happens during their formative teenage years, caught in an uncontrollable cyclone of hormones, unrelenting obsession, and codependency. A time where love and lust are seemingly indistinguishable, and the idea of happily ever after takes over every thought and action. Many find that their first love story ends sooner than expected, and while the experience might be painful at the time, eventually they realize that life goes on and love after love exists. Most people. That wasn't the case on December 9th, 2020 in the small town of Elkview, West Virginia. Located about 20 minutes from the state capital Charleston and nestled on the Elk River, residents of Elkview find themselves happily removed from the city, enjoying a comparatively slower-paced life where relationships with family and friends take precedence. But on that fateful Friday afternoon, all hell broke loose when gunshots began ringing out in a single-family home located at 1384 Cemetery Hill Drive. By the end, nearly an entire family would be victims of homicide. The bodies of 37-year-old Dan Long, 39-year-old Risa Saunders, 12-year-old Gage Ripley, and 3-year-old Jameson Long were found the following Sunday, December 13th at 10.40 a.m., when a relative went to check on the family after being unable to contact them for a few days prior. Curiously, one member of the family was missing, then 16-year-old Gavin Smith. He was eventually located at the home of his girlfriend, then 17-year-old Rebecca Walker, hiding behind a dresser in her room. Gavin would be apprehended without issue and taken in for questioning, where he would immediately confess to being the arbiter of death for his entire family. The details surrounding the circumstances of Gavin's monstrous crimes would soon come to light in the interrogation room, details which include why he did it, an unlikely accomplice, and shockingly, who watched it all happen live. This is the interrogation of Gavin Smith. The raw, unedited interrogation footage of Gavin Smith was obtained by a close friend of morbid curiosity, Just Interrogations, for some of the most unique and fascinating interrogation analysis and coverage, including never-before-seen cases, be sure to subscribe to Just Interrogations, linked in the description below. Investigators enter the room with Gavin after a few minutes, so while we fast forward, let's take a brief moment to thank this video's sponsor, Aura. Have you ever Googled yourself and were shocked to see your personal information exposed on one of those public listing sites? You'd be appalled at how much total information there is about you on the web. What if anyone could find out exactly who you are, where you work, what you drive, who you're associated with? Would you be comfortable with that? Because I definitely wasn't. Data brokers are making a fortune selling your information to robocallers, spammers, and others who want to learn more about you, like where you live. That's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your information and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove your information if you ask them to, but they make it super hard to do. Let Aura handle it for you. You can try Aura free for two weeks using my link. Aura also does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats that you can't see. It's really easy to set up so you don't have to download several different apps to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. You get everything at one affordable price. And if you're weary of the dark web, don't worry. Aura found my information in two separate data breaches from dark web scans and told me what information was exposed and how to keep myself safe. How convenient is that? Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online so you can focus on other things with peace of mind. You can either let people continue to exploit and profit off your private information, or you can go to https colon slash slash aura.com slash morbid to start your two week free trial, also linked in the description. Hey, did you eat already? Uh, no. no, no. You didn't wait on me, did you? <laughs> yeah. I just got it. I know. I don't really like Wendy's pies. Oh, you don't? No. If you guys want, you can have it. Oh, no, I'm good. I got to be one of them four for four things. Then, so uh, I think, uh, there's this guy that we work with in our office. That's all he'll eat. He's four for four.
fours when we go to Wendy's. They're good. That's pretty good. Cool. Would you get the ginger bacon or the crispy chicken? Uh, ginger bacon. That's what I know. <laughs> well, we have to change the taste. Mm -hmm. He's on a diet, so he just eats Cheetos. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> he needs to get on a new one, doesn't he? Yeah. So you say you're in the ninth grade? Mm-hmm. And how's all this e-learning stuff going? Um, play difficult. <laughs> Yeah, I'm used to going to school and doing in class, not in college. Okay. You at the, you at Hoover? Mm -hmm. Where are you going? Yeah. I mean, just kind of stuff would want to happen. I'll be having good grades and all that, but I'm having bad. Um, Y'all used to get good grades. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so have you done the virtual learning the whole year, or are you just doing the? I've been doing e-learning. Since beginning of the year. The whole time? Yeah, since COVID started. Okay, so you've been doing it all year. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of high school kids that are wanting to not go to school and just want to do it from home. Yeah. I don't understand why they want to shut the schools down. Every day there's a kid getting COVID. All right. Well, that's the way it's looking. That's well, the way it's going. These cases keep going up. Mm hmm. What'd you get to drink? Coke. Damn, we got the same order. I think you did. <laughs> Detectives will approach Gavin from the very beginning of their questioning with the volatility of the situation, and given his current circumstances, Gavin's state of mind, as the two most important things to consider at each stage. Remember, in this video, Gavin is only 16 years old, and by his own actions, is essentially left alone in the world. Building trust and rapport with Gavin is key not only to extract his version of events, but the details of those events as well. And if there are any clear areas where they believe or have proof that he is being deceptive, the actual truth. Giving him some fresh food and engaging in small talk with no pressure lays the groundwork for that trust and rapport. Gavin? Yes. So you, do we understand well enough for you what's going on up here when we were back up there up River Haven, mm -hmm. at your girlfriend's house? Yeah. We explained to you everything that's going on, and are you still good with us? Mm -hmm. That form that we explained to you it still applies, okay? Yes. You, so you're good with everything, you understand everything, and um, so we want to uh, we want to understand what happened because you having a lot of times we work a lot of these type of cases where you have a kind of a toxic home life, you know what that means? Like it's just Yeah, I get uh, yeah, yeah. and we and we and we deal with a lot of families that um that the parents mistreat the children and um there's domestic violence in the home, child maltreatment, I child sexual abuse, child abuse. There's all types of different things that we deal with, okay? Yes. We understand that, and then talking to your girlfriend, a couple of our detectives have talked to our girlfriend, and she, she's she's told them um, what all what's been going on, what, what, what's been going on, and um, she obviously you told her what happened up there, right? Yeah, uh, at, at the house, that. huh? I've been all that. Yeah, well, and, and what all's happened with your family up there that, that has died, okay? Detectives have informed Gavin within roughly eight minutes of beginning the official interrogation that upon speaking to Gavin's girlfriend, Rebecca Walker, after his capture at her grandmother's house, they have learned about the alleged mistreatment that Gavin was subjected to by his family. In addition, they have laid their cards on the table that Rebecca has provided information about his family's murder, but at the same time, they have only mentioned that she has given information. They have not revealed what that information is. By alluding to the fact that they know the truth, rather than saying what information they know, detectives can potentially manipulate a suspect into providing corroborating information by their own accord. In other words, confess by their own volition. Uh, that I don't know, but I know about the... Huh? I said I didn't know about the decision, but I know about the... 
because that's what they used to do yeah, all the time. Okay, well, like I said, you're, you go, you just go ahead and tell us about that. Tell us about all of that. Well, do you want me to start from the beginning? Yeah, just start from the beginning here. Well, sometimes down April, my stepdad used to abuse me all the time if I didn't do something he wanted or something like that. I, okay. And I would send my girlfriend photos of the uh, bruises and wear marks and all that. And any time he didn't get his way, he would help me. And oh, yeah. so with my mom, like, she punched me in the mouth a couple times because I didn't do what she wanted. Like, well, I don't know what it was, but they would have been there every time I didn't want to do something that I shouldn't have done. Okay. So, first of all, who all lives in your house? How old are you? You're 16? 16, 16. What's your date of birth? Zero five, wait, five, five, seventeen, oh five. Five, seventeen, oh five. I know, oh five. Oh four. Oh. Yes. And if I and if I say something that that's wrong, you you're not wrong or correcting me, okay? All right. All right. So, um, who all lives at the house with you? My mom, my stepdad, my baby brother, and my younger brother. Okay. What are all their names? Dave is the youngest. Well, not the youngest. Younger brother. James is the baby, uh, Dan is the stepdad, and Mom is the Lisa. Okay. All I S I. I can't pronounce how it's hard. Your mom's name's what? Lisa with the R. Lisa. Lisa. Yeah. Oh, I can't pronounce. R I S A. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, gotcha. Um. It should be noted here that the detectives will occasionally have a hard time understanding Gavin because of his pronunciation of words that include the letters L and R. These are symptoms of the speech impediments known as rhoticism and lambdacism. Both can generally be resolved via speech therapy, as they can be learned behaviors through youth. In some psychological circles, it is believed that speech impediments like rhoticism and lambicism that exist beyond childhood are correlated to parental neglect. There is no hard data to provide a conclusive answer one way or another, but we will provide more information by the end of this video that can help you come to your own conclusion. So how old are your brothers? 11, 3, Gage is 11, and Jameson is 3. Jameson is three. That's your okay. And they, are they your two brothers? They're your biological brothers. They're not like your half brothers or step brothers or anything like that. Yeah, they're by different dads. Okay, but it's, they're all three. You all, your mom's kids. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So when did stepdad come into the picture? When did he? Well, when I started sixth grade, began sixth grade. Okay. And you began sixth grade when your stepdad. I the first of many inconsistencies. Roughly two minutes ago, Gavin said that the abuse began in April of that year, 2020. Now he's just contradicted himself by saying that it began in the sixth grade. When did he start? When did he meet your mom? When did they get married? Uh, they got married somewhere in June, June or July. Of when? Last year. Of last year? Mm hmm Okay. Had they been together before that? Uh, they've been together since 2016. Since 2016? Yeah, since I got in sixth grade. Okay. And when did the, the abuse start? Well, it started this April. I just, yeah. This past April? Yeah. Okay. Gavin switches yet again to his original claim of the mistreatment beginning in April. And what was going on? Well, we had a lot of family problems. Like, my aunt, she has cancer down in her area and on a, like a normal cancer, yeah. Except it's a very well kind of one, and we've been just dealing with that a lot. And my grandmother passed away in 2013, and Dan started blaming me for her death and all that, saying I was the one gave it to her, and, which you can't give her cancer. Right. Gavin says that his stepfather, Dan, blamed him for his grandmother's passing in 2013, but again, only moments ago, he gave information that contradicts this current claim. Gavin said that Dan and his mother, Risa, met in 2016, a full three years after his grandmother had passed away. It just been by them and I... I understand. Does he mean to your brothers, too? No, it's only me. Why is that? I wish I knew. Because I take care of Jameson all the time. Like, they, he calls me daddy, which is a bad thing since I'm his oldest brother. 
You know, like I've been taking him since day one, since he got out of the hospital. Mm-hmm. It's just been hard. Okay. Now, is your real dad? Is he your real? I actually don't know where he is. I actually never met him. You never met your real dad? I want to, but I never met him. Okay. What about your mom? How are you and your mom get along? Not well. I don't talk to her at all. You don't? No. Yeah. Okay. What about your little brothers? No, I usually just talk to James and make him all happy. But Gage, I don't ever talk to him. Gage is the 11 year old, right? Mm hmm. Jameson's a 3 year old? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, <clears throat> um, how long have you been at uh, your girlfriend's house? A couple of days. Okay. And tell us about how you ended up there. Well, she asked me to come over because she's needed help with school and she's been having a very hard time with her mother's death that happened last month. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to come over and I asked my stepdad, well, my mom, let's go over there. They said, yeah, just be back by Tuesday. And that and I've been there since. Okay. Have you been doing your schooling? Yeah, she's been, we've been helping each other with school. Okay. So you've been doing virtual learning or Schoology or whatever it's called. Schoology. Schoology. I don't know. Yeah, however you say it. You've been doing that at? Um, Our house, yes. Okay. And what's your girlfriend's name? Rebecca. Rebecca. Uh, Wava. Okay. With W-A-L-K-E-R. Okay. Um, how long have y'all been together? Since March 28th. Oh, this year? Mm-hmm. So, well, Almost nine months. Yeah, just about nine months. Well, how do you all communicate? Talking. Uh, do you mean this? Yeah, media? yeah, yeah. Social media. We usually talk through Instagram and Skype. Skype? Mostly Skype. That's yeah, how we kicked, it, we kicked it off and on Snapchat. Then we just went to Skype and Instagram. Okay. You talk to her on Facebook? I don't really like Facebook. Huh? I don't really like Facebook. Okay. What's your Snapchat name? Uh, hold on. It's been so long since I've been in that account. Demon Child. Something. If I no, I tell you, I just don't remember it. Okay. What about your Instagram name? Shadow. No, it's just weird names. It's 1987 after Shadow Panther. Shadow Panther 1987. Mm -hmm. Um. Do you have a Facebook? I mean, I used it, but I deleted that account. Okay. Like it's gone. When did you do that? I got that in April, but then some person uh, hacked into it. And another one tried to blackmail me, and I just deleted the account. Okay. What, what about cell phone? You have a cell phone? No, sir. You don't have a cell phone? No, because the last time I had a cell phone, uh, Dan smashed it. I Dan? Him. Yeah, after he found out, I was telling him back for what's been going on. Okay. Um... So, how did, Gavin, here's the thing. Um, like I said, we're, we have investigators up there at, at your house, okay? Yes, sir. And we talked to you up there and said you're, they're, your family, some of your family members are deceased, okay? You know what that means, they're dead, right? Yeah. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of evidence in this case. I think you mentioned where up the road there that you watch a lot of these shows and you see how a lot of this stuff goes, so you know what what we can do as cops yeah. to try to figure out how things happen, right? Yes, sir. So, obviously, um, with something serious like this, with a bunch of... Yeah, I, I understand your point. ...dead people in the house. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you're gone, and we find you at your girlfriend's house. We find your girlfriend and talk to your girlfriend, and your girlfriend's she's coming off on everything, okay? She's telling us everything that you've told her about what happened at your house, okay? Yes, sir. So what we're wanting is to get the truth from you okay. about what happened at your house and how your family ended up dead, okay? Yes, sir. We, we want the truth from you, okay? I know I had to lie to a cop anyways, because yeah. I've been around them all my life. Yeah, so we, we just want the truth from you, okay? We just want to kind of know what was going through your head when everything happened, yeah. okay? Yes. So can you, can you tell us what happened? The interrogation is moving swiftly. The lead investigator gently rejects Gavin's first story, that he doesn't know what happened, and says that he just wants the truth. Gavin seems to be responsive to this and begins talking. 
Well, I thought I thought you did listen on that. Um, a couple of days ago, before all this happened, I didn't know. Of, um, me and my mom was cooking, and I told her, well, I tried to open up to her, and she just said I faked it all because I'm currently depressed. Faked all what? Saying I fake cut myself, which I haven't cut myself yet uh, for a couple months. Okay. And you can't fake cutting yourself. Right. And she said I was faking all this, and I was just one attention. And then, uh, then I overhauled it, and he helped me with that. Dan overheard it? Yeah, and now that night he helped me with that. How did he hurt you? He hit me down now. Down where? Your private area? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Gavin has just claimed that his stepfather, Dan, had punitively touched Gavin below his waist. With this allegation, Gavin has also introduced the possible existence of sexual abuse to not only damage Dan's character, but to lay the groundwork for what Gavin would adamantly claim was his motive for the massacre. Okay, what do you call that? I don't say penis. I say that D word. That's what, whatever words you use or fine. I don't want to disrespect y'all. Uh, you're not going to disrespect me, buddy. I heard it all. No, I probably said it all, too. <laughs> so. Yeah, but I said it all. Yeah. So what do you call that word down there? Dick. You're dick. Yeah. He hit you in your dick. Yeah. How did he hit you in your dick? He grabbed me on the hill and he punched me right. Um, he hit me right in the dick when he grabbed me in the shoulder. Okay. Now, how did he do that one time or one he, time? He he done that a lot of times. Okay. Okay. Was that? Are you talking about he did that a lot of times that night, or he did it a lot of times like? He that did before? it in the past before. Okay. And he did a couple nights ago. Okay, how many times did he hit you a couple nights ago? He hit me two times in the dick and he punched me in the gut. Okay. I don't have that mark on him because there's a wet mark. Okay. Now, so this is your stepdad? Mm hmm Okay, and what happened after that? I just, I went to bed and I just fell asleep crying in pain. Okay. And then the next day, uh, Thursday, Thursday, yeah, Thursday, uh, I asked my mom, can I go to Rebecca's hangout if I'll help her what she's been going through and all that. She says, sure, yeah, you can go as long as you do your school. And I left that day, and I haven't seen him since. Okay. Gavin's story seems to conveniently end with him not being anywhere near Cemetery Hill Drive when the murders happened, and that he was a victim of abuse by the hands of one of the deceased. Gavin goes on to introduce some sort of unnamed group of unrelated people who want to kill Risa, but beyond their existence, has no sort of explanation for why they would want to harm her. While it is obvious from the beginning that Gavin wasn't telling the truth, his half-baked lies aren't even worth the detectives unpacking. Once again, they gently reject what Gavin has said and ask for the truth. Because I know for a fact my mom, uh, she talked to me about it. She has a couple people that wants to kill her. But I, God knows reasons, I don't know how, because she never did anything wrong. Well, Gavin, what we're getting at is we talked to Rebecca, and yeah. you told Rebecca everything you did. Yes, sir. Okay. So Rebecca has told one of our detectives what you told her. So we know what happened. Yes, and sir. what I want you to do, I just want you to be honest with us, okay, <clears throat> about what you did, what happened to your family, okay? And it's important that we understand why why people do things, why you would do something like this, okay? Because we understand, we, we kind of see the picture, but it, we need to understand from your your point of view, from your from your words, from your mindset, what was going on yeah. that caused you to do those things, okay? And you need to tell us what you did, okay? Yeah. Because uh, he's, Dan has been trying to kill me the past few days. Okay. Like he would, he cut me right there. Okay. With a knife. Okay. Yeah, and then he's been just trying to kill me while he can. Okay. And I've been able to sleep well only until I got to my girlfriend's. I've been just sleeping on the couch. It's been helping me with them. Okay. Gavin says what amounts to nothing more than nonsensical gibberish, putting his head into his hands to subconsciously soothe himself. His right leg bounces throughout the interview, an understandable byproduct of the massive amounts of stress and nervousness he's feeling, but notably, when he's concocting completely new stories, it will sit still. Only when he's changing the story, he will unknowingly bounce his leg. This is a nervous response to Gavin's uncomfortability to the act of lying almost completely off the cuff. 
Well, you told your girlfriend that you killed your family, okay? I know, got it. And just like that, Gavin's story collapses. Now, with a confession in hand, detectives shift their focus to extracting Gavin's motive. He killed his family, but why did he kill his family? And you regret it? No. Well, you need to tell us what you did and why you did it. That's what we want to know, okay? That day, um, that morning, then he put his gun to my head. Okay. And try to make me do what it's gay. What he tried to make me do. He tried to make me shock him. Dan did. Yeah, because mom wanted to do it anymore. Huh? I said because mom wouldn't do it anymore. What mom wouldn't do it anymore? Yeah, shock him. That was that. And he tried to do that, and I lost it. Okay. Gavin has now doubled down on the allegations of abuse at the hands of his stepfather. After introducing the potentiality of abuse within the realm of sexualized nature moments ago, Gavin now directly implicates Dan as being the perpetrator of a specifically charged assault against him. Due to the sensitive nature of this claim, the current progress into the investigation, and the lack of evidence to support or contradict this claim, investigators will allow Gavin to tell his story, unpacking details as they go along. Doing so will either provide some directional input on where the investigation needs to be prioritized, or if the claims are weak with little to no support from Gavin's words, the cracks will show and allow detectives to pick apart and shoot down this potential defense that Gavin is building, which is that Gavin killed Dan as a result of being the victim of his escalating abuse. Who all was there when that happened? Yeah, okay. What room were y'all in? Well, huh? Yeah, well. Who's room? My mom and dad's room. Mom and dad's room? Okay. Um, what day was this? Wednesday, Thursday. It's one of those two days. Okay. What time of day was it? I don't know. I didn't pay attention. Was it daytime, nighttime? Daytime. It was daytime? Okay. Was it before you ate lunch or after you ate lunch, or you remember? I didn't eat at all that day. You didn't eat at all that day. This specific detail that Gavin didn't eat all day, this seemingly innocuous statement is something to make note of. During Gavin's trial, photos from the house on Cemetery Hill showed that there were locks where the food was stored. Prosecutors would state that this was necessary because Gavin and Gage would feverishly consume food at an outstanding rate, which would cause issues nearly every month since the family was on a small fixed income. The defense would counter this, saying that it was evidence of an abusive home. Gavin and Gage were two growing teenage boys who needed to eat. At the same time, both parents, Dan and Risa, were clearly well-fed and would have been considered medically obese. The defense would argue that a food shortage wasn't the reason for the locks. It was to add an extra layer of control and manipulation over their children's lives. Comment down below what you think. Well, well tell us what happened when you lost it. I know, I accidentally shot him. Huh? I accidentally shot him. You accidentally shot him? All of them. All of them? How'd you accidentally shoot him, buddy? I didn't realize what I was doing. What do you mean by that? Yes, I wasn't thinking straight. And then I still grabbed that gun and I pulled the trigger. Okay. Who'd you shoot first? Dan. Huh? Dan. Okay. You shot Dan first? It's okay, buddy. We're going to work through this, okay? <clears throat> So you shot Dan first. Where did you shoot Dan? In the head. In the head? No, he quit. Okay. I know, man, but that happened. Well, what happened after that? I shot him all in the head after. You shot who all in the head after? Mom, then Gage, then Jay. Mom, then Gage, then... Jameson. Jameson? Okay. Where were they all? Tell me. Tell us about where everybody was whenever you shot Blonde them. Dan was in bed when I shot them. Were they asleep or asleep? Yeah. And when I got done with that, uh, Gage, I walked Gemma, my dog, and I came back and Gage was trying to kill Jay. 
While Gavin runs through the series of events that happened on that fateful December day, he glosses over something that will completely shift the nature of the entire situation. After Dan and Risa were shot, but while Gage and Jameson were still alive, Gavin called his girlfriend, Rebecca. The way Gavin recalls what happened, listeners would naturally assume each action begins and ends before the next one. Gavin is being deceptive by omission. He didn't first call Rebecca at that time, and he didn't only voice call Rebecca, and some of Gavin's actions did not conclude before starting the next. As the interview progresses, we, as well as the investigators, will see that Gavin's well of deception is nearly bottomless. He put the knife to his James's during chest there, and I shot Gage on in the head. Why was he doing that? Because James wouldn't shut up. He was screaming, crying, and okay. So your mom and and Dan, your okay. mom's name's Risa, right? Yes. They were in bed. Were they asleep when you shot them? Yeah. Okay. Why'd you do that? I lost it. I wasn't thinking straight. Okay. I thought you said whenever you lost it, Dan had tried to make you suck him. Yeah, that was before all that happened. Okay. It was that morning he tried to make me suck him. Okay, but that, okay. Sometime during that day I sucked him. Okay. And where did you get the gun? The dresser. Whose dresser? Dan's, Dan yeah. and Mom's dresser. Okay. What kind of gun was it? A forty. Huh? A forty. A forty. Forty caliber. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to find. It. I don't know what. It's a forty caliber. Okay. What kind of? Are we talking like a big gun, a handgun? It's a handgun. Okay. So I I call that a pistol. You know what a pistol is? Yeah. Okay. What color is it? Black. Black. Um. You know what make it is? What? What make is it? Like. I don't remember. Okay. Like you know much about guns at all? I mean, I play Call of Duty, but I don't know that much. Okay. okay. So like we carry Springfields, they have Glocks and. Oh, uh, it's Smith a Glock. And, are you sure it's a Glock? Yeah, it looks like a Smith and Wesson, and okay. but it also looks like a Glock. Okay. I don't know. But it's a pistol. Yeah. It's okay. A pistol. Did you load the gun or was it already? It was already loaded. Did you have to rack the gun? Like, uh, uh, no, it was only uh, was already worn in there. Yeah. Whose gun is it? Dan's. Dan's. Does he always keep it in the dresser there? Mm-hmm. Okay. I just really got a punch. I understand. So you you shot uh, you shot mom and Dan in in the bed. Yes. Where was everybody else when you shot them? Gage was. Uh, if I shot Gage. He went into the room, and I shot him right there. Okay. And I had to kill Jay because Gage slit his throat right here. Gage slit his throat? And not his own throat, but he slit James' throat right there. Why did Gage slit James' throat? Because he kept on screaming. James kept on screaming, he won't calm down. Was Gage with you when you did all this, or did he see all this? Uh, he didn't see any of it. Then why would he slit? He held it. He held the gunshots, but... There's something patently strange about what Gavin is telling detectives. In his version of events, he shot Dan and his mother while they were in their bed, then he called Rebecca, and then took his dog for a walk. When he came back in, he came across his younger brother, Gage, putting a knife to baby Jameson's throat, seemingly because Jameson wouldn't stop crying, and Gavin shot Gage to stop him. This doesn't seem to make any sense, because it doesn't make any sense. Gavin is trying to provide explanations for extraneous injuries to Jameson, the knife wounds to his neck, and why Gage was shot. Remember, though, Gavin said that unrelenting mistreatment, abuse, and neglect from both Dan and Risa were the reasons why he, quote, lost it. But Gavin went beyond executing Dan and Risa, killing both his younger brothers as well, and is now attempting to provide some sort of justified defense that he's almost certainly concocting as the conversation progresses. And James and started screaming real loud, like he wanted to calm down, and Gage couldn't take it, and he put a knife to James and started trying to slit it, and I shot Gage right there. Because I put, I told that baby that I'll protect him since it one. I promised him. So you shot, where did you shoot Gage? Head. Okay, where in the house were you when you shot him? In the room. Hmm? In the room. In whose room? Mom and Okay. Was he 
sitting, standing, laying standing. On, when you shot him, when you shot Gage. Yes. And Mom and Dan were laying in bed. Mm -hmm. What about Jameson? Where was Jameson when you shot him? He was in his own room, mine and his room. Okay. Well, Why did you shoot Jameson? Because he was bleeding from my hell. Like, you can't save someone if you slit someone's throat. Okay. I didn't want to do it, but I didn't like seeing him in pain. Okay. Did you cut Jameson's throat? No, Gage did before I shot Gage. Another inconsistency. Gavin shot Gage to stop him, and Jameson was in his room. But Gage was shot in the back of the head inside of Dan and Reese's room. As we continue, keep in mind that Gavin also said that Jameson was actively bleeding from his neck. I popped this out since day one. Okay. How did you know that gun was loaded? Did you check it? No, yeah, Dan told me. Because me and my grandpa... We took our guns out because that's Dan's gun and he loaded it, Dan did, and we forgot to go shooting. Okay. Well, where's your room in this house? Same one Jameson's room is. Okay. Where, how was Jameson when you shot him? What was, what was he doing? Standing up. He was standing? He was grabbing his throat, trying to, because he was screaming in pain. Okay. I just kind of Gavin says that he murdered Jameson because he was screaming in pain and earlier said that Jameson's injuries were severe enough that he considered him mortally wounded. These two statements cannot be concurrently true. If Jameson was screaming, his airways would have been functioning at least to some degree and his vocal cords would still be intact. Gavin stated and demonstrated that Jameson's cuts were on the front of his neck. In order to damage the carotid artery from the front of the neck, the trachea would have to be severed first, which would have removed Jameson's ability to scream and to breathe. If Jameson suffered an injury to his carotid artery, not only would he have died from exsanguination or bleeding out, he would have lost consciousness prior to that due to the sudden drop in blood pressure. You couldn't deal with it? I'm saying I can't deal with it. I'm screaming like that in pain. Okay. I'm sorry, but I can't hear very good, so I'm just trying to... Okay. I'm trying to make sure I understand what you're telling me, okay? So what did you do with the gun after? Where's the gun? I put it back. You put it back? In the dresser. It's in the dresser? Mm -hmm. You didn't take it with you? Mm -hmm. No. Did you get any blood on your clothes or anything? No, so. From all this? Mm -hmm. What were you wearing? This. You were wearing those clothes? Yeah, I had jeans on though, but they had a big whip in it, and I threw them away. You had a big whip in A big whip. Big because, rip? Yeah, whip. Oh, like on the knee? Yeah. Okay. I threw them away because they had a bunch of holes in it. Okay, were you wearing those shoes? Yes, sir. Can you tell us a little bit about the knife? Yeah, it was okay. a chin. Uh, it was a kitchen knife. Mm -hmm. That's and it wasn't way that sharp. It was a dull knife, but mm -hmm. you could still cut something with a dull knife. Okay. Well, here's the thing, um, Gavin. So with the knife, so we have detectives that are up at your house right now collecting everything. You said you watch those shows where so, you're right there. You watch those shows. You know we're going to do the DNA testing and all that on there. Yes. Sir. Um, if your DNA is going to be on the on the handle of that knife, yes, sir. that's something we need to know. I just want to make sure we're getting the truth from you, okay? Yeah, after I kill Gage, I tuck, I tuck the knife and I put it back. I put it on the shelf in the hallway. Okay, that's the last time I touched that knife. Well, Gavin, I think I think what we're well getting. At, I don't think Gavin. I mean, I don't think uh, Gage cut Jameson's throat. I think you did. Well, was after I shot Gage, Gage shot the knife. I picked up the knife and I put it on the hallway okay. shelf. And I, what what I what I think the reason I think that is because I think that um, that's what you feel the most bad about what you did. I, I, I mean, I understand. I I think you probably feel bad about all of it. I felt very bad for Cameron Jameson too. 
mean, but I think that that's probably the thing that's got you the most tore up over all this is that you killed that baby. That's it. As expected, Gavin's story was so weak and unintelligible that the investigators immediately challenged him on it. They bluntly tell Gavin that they believe he's fabricating this story out of guilt derived from taking Jameson's life, and Gavin confirms this. Gavin likely wants to rewrite history where he was morally justified in the killing of his brothers for three reasons. One, to provide some relief towards his own internal guilt and turmoil over the reality of his actions. Two, to offload the blame for said actions to a person who can't argue otherwise. And three, if all else fails, being ethically justified in the mercy killing of Jameson, who he believed to have injuries too severe to be compatible with life, and whose final moments were doomed to be spent suffering and pain and agony. If he can convince them, Gavin wants the investigators to believe that Jameson's fate was already sealed by Gage's hands, who Gavin shot to try to save Jameson, and then ended Jameson's suffering out of love for him. Gavin didn't want them to die. Gage was the judge of their fate, not Gavin. Everyone is to blame, except Gavin. And I, I don't think that Gage, the, the story, the, everything's making sense, but the part where you're saying that um, Gage cut Jameson's throat and then you shot Jameson while he was standing, that doesn't make sense. No, because Jameson was standing. He was what the sound of bed when I shot him. And that Gage just heard the crying and cut Jameson's throat, and then you came in and killed Gage and killed Jameson. Yeah. That, that's that's that part's not making a whole lot of sense. Does that make? Does that? I might have messed up though. I'm not thinking straight. Once again, Gavin nearly immediately folds to any challenges of his story, admitting that there are mistakes to the story he just spent nearly six minutes confidently spitting up and elaborating on. I understand, and I understand you probably feel bad about all this. Okay, but well, we we just don't want um, we just want to make sure we we fill in the whole complete picture. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. And that part about you saying that Gage slit the back of the throat after you killed your mom, and your stepdad, and then you killed I killed mom, dad, mom, Gage, and Jay. yeah, and then but the the whole part about Gage cutting the baby's throat doesn't make. I got it all mixed up. I'm sorry. What'd you get mixed up about? The knife and the knife part. Okay. Well, tell us about that. After I killed Gage, I had a knife in my hands, but I couldn't do it. So I put a knife on his mouth and I shot him. Never can find this happen. What did you get the knife out for? I used it for wood. Okay. Because it's, it's a dog knife and we used it to cut pieces of wood, like tiny pieces off. Mm -hmm. That's what I've been using it for. Where did you get the knife from? The detectives consistently try to lead Gavin towards confessing the purpose of the knife what it was used for, the answer to which is, it was for Jameson. Take note of Gavin's refusal to admit any usage of the knife specifically in his crimes, a clear indicator of his internal struggle to come to terms with his unquestionably demonic actions. Uh, the kitchen. Like in a drawer, or is there like a holder for it? A holder, windows pull out kind of deal. It was in the kitchen? Where was it in the kitchen? What was it near? Uh... It's in that black uh, kitchen set order where you just pull it out and you put it back in. You slide that in. Okay. So what did you? What were you going to use the knife for that day? I was going to hurt myself with it after I realized what I was going to what I did, but probably good. What is it? I'm sorry. I said I was going to use it on myself. I don't realize what I did to everybody. Okay. But I changed my mind. Okay. So did you cut Jameson's throat? No. Okay. So did Jameson's throat get cut? Okay. I got mixed up. I'm sorry. It's okay. Well, I mean, if if, if Jameson has a cut on his throat, it'll, our investigators will find it up there. We I just... know. I mean, he, 
he had a little tiny cut, but that was a couple of days ago, like before all this happened. Because what me and him was playing, and he cut the edge of his neck off of one of the toys. Okay. So, and I totally got him. Another inconsistency. Gavin says that a few days ago, a sharp end of a toy cut Jameson's neck. But eight minutes ago, Gavin said that Jameson was bleeding from the front of his neck. So I just want to make sure I'm clear. The gauge, see, gauge did not cut Jameson's throat. The gauge did not cut Jameson's throat. I'm sorry. Well, why did you tell us that to begin with? I got messed up. Okay. No, I am way sorry. I know you are, buddy. So what made you want to do all this? The abuse, no, that I couldn't tell that anymore. Because he's Dan, he's been trying to kill me constantly. The detectives choose not to apply pressure on Gavin for the completely fabricated story he had just told them and reverse back to a question that they had just asked. Why did Gavin do this? Gavin takes the opportunity to yet again amplify the villainous role that he's painting Dan in, saying that Dan was actively trying to murder him prior to the shootings. What do you mean by that? Like, I sent like that guy photos of bruises. Like, I had a, well, I don't know, I had a big giant bruise that big from Dan. Mm -hmm. And it was swelled up so bad, and Dan used to hit me in the back all the time and all that. Mm -hmm. Just for fun, because he would giggle. And my back would lock up on oh, Alpha Bell and Move. Okay. And Mom didn't even do anything about it. But she saw Dan abuse me. And Dan has punched me. He punched me right here. Right there. And I had a black eye. And he hit me again on the other side. I had two other black eyes. Okay. Has CPS ever been to your house? You know CPS is? What CPS? Child Protective Service. <laughs> no, but I've been trying to get a hold of them, but I can't. Okay. Did anybody at the school ever notice any of this stuff? Mm-mm. It happened when all this COVID, I had to stay home kind of deal. Okay. Did, uh, did the police ever get called to your house for anything? No, not that I know of. Okay. Is there anything else we didn't ask you about you think's important? We you mind to sit in here for a second? I'll be right back. Yeah. My house? Yes. At Cemetery Hill Drive. Okay. Who, whose house is that? Mom's. That's your mom's? How it long? was originally my grandma's because she passed away. Okay. How long have you lived there? For five years. I used to live with my grandpa. Five years? Five years. Four? Yeah. Okay. Since middle school. Since middle school? And you said that your mom and Dan got the other win? Something before I started in middle school, sixth grade. Okay. That summer I was before middle school. And how long has Dan been living there with you all? Oh, five years. Okay. And then you said they got married when? This year, and June or July, but more they, than those months. But they've been together for about four years, and he's lived with you during that time frame? Yes. Um, had you been in contact with any like CPS workers or law enforcement or anything like that? I called CPS a couple times before because I, I would sneak a device from my neighbor like they let me call them. You would sneak and do what? i sneak a phone and try to contact CPS. They wouldn't ever pick up. Okay. But you were in contact with deputies and... That, no. I never thought about calling the police. I always thought about calling CPS. 
Well, how come you didn't call the police or tell CPS about this if he came in contact with Ray? If I came in contact with CPS, I would have told him that. Okay. What about law enforcement? Were you familiar with any of the deputies that we have working down here? No, I'm familiar to the one up in Jackson County, but not the ones down okay. there. Well, how come you didn't tell anybody about this, Scout? I was just scared. Okay. Because Dan Dunn said if I ever told anyone that he would physically help me so bad that I'd be in the hospital. Okay. Well, I understand that you're angry towards Dan. Okay. And I understand, you know, how your mom kind of wasn't. Um, how did you, she, you say she take up for Dan or? She would take up for Dan. Like she wouldn't try to stop him there. She would just say, don't watch. Okay. Well, why did you kill your little brothers? Because Gage was in it too. He was he would help Dan help me. Like Gage would help me too, you know that. Give them an inch, they take a mile. The investigator offers some compassion. He can understand why Gavin would be upset with Dan if Dan was Gavin's abuser. He can understand why Gavin was upset at his mother Risa if Risa was aware of the situation and did nothing, even watching at times. Gavin makes the connection immediately and when asked about Gage, offers a wildly different reason this time around. Gage would also abuse Gavin at the instruction and behest of Dan. Gavin just completely wipes the story of Jameson being attacked off the table and offers a completely new story. Aside from the fact that Gage was four years younger than Gavin and much smaller, Gavin has been far from forthcoming with the truth at this point. Why would the officers be inclined to believe Gavin's new story now? Why'd you kill Jameson? I don't know. Because no one was taking care of him. Because, like I said, I've been taking care of him since day one. He's been calling me daddy. Okay. Well, why'd you kill your mom? Because she's been trying to get rid of me. Gavin buries his head in his hands, shielding his eyes from the detective's gaze when he's asked the most difficult questions. If the killings were sparked by the abuse, why was Jameson killed? If Risa wasn't directly abusing him, why did she have to die? After a brief moment to think, Gavin peers out from underneath his hands to provide his weak explanations. We you mean get rid of it? Giant... They have been, well, mom, she's been trying to get me in jail and all that. Because I went away because of the abuse. I went away to my grandpa's one year deputy, so familiar with them. And they put a restraint on against him because all he ever did was protect me. Who's your grandpa? Grandpa. What's Great grandpa? grandfather. What's your great grandfather's name? Buster Saunders. Buster Saunders? Okay. Did he know what was going on with all the babies? I uh, know not that, but he knew what was going on about the baby situation. What about the baby situation? Me taking care of James in twenty four seven, feeding him, buying him stuff. Like when I got money, I went buy all myself, I buy on James. Okay. Well, why'd you kill Dan? Because all the things that he's ever done to me. When asked about why Dan was killed, Gavin doesn't bury his head or think, showing that Gavin is at least in part telling the truth, or more likely, that his story had been prepared and rehearsed. Like I said, I get that. I just don't understand. I'm trying to understand why you killed Gage and Jameson. I mean, Gage, he... Dan would hold me against my will, like against the wrong... He would let Gage punch me. What? I don't know. That's what I want to know. When did that happen last? Ever since Dan started abusing me. Okay. Now, how long has that been? Since March? No, April. Dan started abusing me ever since this COVID thing started. Like physically abusing? Physically abusing emotionally. Like so bad I would end up slicing myself, getting fat with I know earlier you said Dan tried to make you suck his dick. Yeah. Gavin was asked about the types of abuse that Dan subjected him to, and Gavin responds with physical and emotional abuse. Once again, another inconsistency. Gavin said at the beginning of the questioning that Dan's escalation into trying to force Gavin to please him was the event that caused him to snap. It would make sense that this form of abuse would arguably be the most important one when under questioning, but Gavin leaves it out. To the investigators, Gavin is continuously contradicting himself on this point and building only doubt behind him, not credence. Has he done that before? 
He tried, but I wouldn't do it. Have you ever done it? Mm -hmm. Never she's ever tried to get you to? No. Have he ever tried to... Uh, he has got sabotage me. Huh? He has got sabotage me. Like I told you guys, try to make me suck him, and he has whipped a couple of my shots off. How? Let's run up by me again. I said he has got sabotage me. Like, towards you? Yeah, like trying to make me suck his dick. Yeah. And he has whipped a couple of my shots off. Like, they would be tall up kind of deal. Mm -hmm. when did, how long has that been going on? Well, a couple of my shots got wet from him, so, um, a couple months ago. Like a month or two. month or two? Mm -hmm. How many times did this happen? Three times. Three times? He tried to make me something. Okay. Over how long a time span? Mm -hmm. Nothing from November, like from September to November. That. Because mom wanted to do him. Okay. And when was the most recent time that you did, that he tried to? November. Okay. I thought you said he made you try to the other day. Yeah, I'm saying November he tried to make me. Okay. And from September to November he tried to make me something. Okay. Yet again, Gavin tells another inconsistency. Roughly 25 minutes ago, Gavin said that on the day of the shootings, Dan put a gun to his head and tried to force Gavin to perform on him. Gavin has, for all intents and purposes, no grasp on what he previously said. Now he's saying that the last time that Dan did that was in November, at minimum two weeks before the shootings. And how did he try to make you suck it? He wet my, he would try to wet my clothes off me. And he would grab me by the head and try to force me down. And he would pull his stick out and try to get me to suck him. Did you ever do it? Mm -mm, no. How did you get it to stop? I kind of hit him in the dick. Hmm? I kind of punched him in the dick. Because I didn't want to. Okay. Well, my understanding is you've had contact with some of our deputies for other things. I don't know if you ran away or... And my beef on the one in the way. Okay. Like, that's how, the only times. So. How come you didn't tell any of our deputies about all this stuff that was going on? No, I just scared. What were you scared of? I've been terrified ever since Dan did all this. Hmm. I said I've been terrified to tell anyone ever since Dan did all this. Okay. Well, how long had you been planning to kill your family? A couple of days before it all happened. A couple of days before? Before it all happened. Did you tell anybody about what you were planning to do? Well, I told Rebecca, but I regret never doing that. You told Rebecca what? I, I told Rebecca about we could, I was doing all this. Okay. Did you tell her before you did it? Mm hmm How did you tell her? I told her I was going to kill them. Okay. Gavin just made two very, very big mistakes. In the state of West Virginia, first-degree murder requires malice. Malice is defined as having intent to kill, a reckless disregard for human life, or an evil motive. Gavin has just confessed to having begun the planning of the murders a few days prior. He admitted to his intent to kill. But Gavin did more than essentially seal his own fate. He's just implicated his girlfriend, Rebecca, as well. When asked if anyone was aware of his plans before they were carried out, with no hesitation, Gavin admits that he told Rebecca. Gavin's statement, Rebecca's statements upon questioning, and communication records would culminate in Rebecca being considered an accomplice to the murders due to her lack of action upon learning of Gavin's plans and more. She would be charged with four counts of first-degree murder just three days after Gavin's interrogation. Watch until the end to learn exactly what Rebecca did and why she did it. How did you tell her? Like, were you telling her in person, on the phone, or on mes messages, or what? Uh, it was on messages. What kind of messages? Google. Huh? Google. Google? Google. How, how does that work out? Uh, duo. Google Duo. Huh? Google Duo. Google Duo? Okay. Oh, Google Meet. It's one of those. We okay. can text and bitch at the same time. Okay. Do you have, like, an account for that, or how does that work? I do have an account for it. You do? What's your account name for? Uh, well, it's more like an email. Okay. What's your email? Well, I'm way far. That's my birthday. X. Wait, that's birthday. 
2005, X 2003. Okay, Green Reaper. Grim Reaper. Grim Reaper. Yeah. Okay. And then what is it? Then the West is just a at gmail dot com. Grim Reaper. 2005, X 2003 at gmail dot com. Okay. And that's your Rebecca's birth year. Where was everyone else whenever Dan would try to make it? Like your, your little brothers and your mom, where would they be at in the house? They would be out of the house. They would be gone? Yeah, they'd be gone. Like, they would leave me and Dan alone in the house. Like, mom would take Gage and Jensen, fall mm-hmm. out or something, and Dan would... So every time Dan has tried to get you... Every to time me and Dan was alone. Yeah, so you guys have always been alone every time it's been tried by it. Yeah. And yet another contradiction, one of many up until now, and one of many more to come. Less than 30 minutes ago, when Gavin was asked about who was home during the alleged incident that made him snap, he said everyone. Just a few seconds ago, however, Gavin said that he and Dan would be home alone during every one of these alleged assaults. Now I always stay cooped up in my whim. Did you ever tell uh, your grandpa Buster about this? Mm Mm-mm. No, because I'm a fight, though. Yeah, he knows that James and me didn't kill him for like seven or But he doesn't know any about the, like, the physical abuse from the sexual advances. No one knows that. Because that's what Becca knows the sexual abuse and all that, because I taught him. I just went back there and all this. I mean, if I didn't get a person on this, but Dan didn't do all this to me, then this would happen. Gavin wants to make sure that the investigators know that it's not his fault that all this happened. It's Dan's. It's a strange and dubious moral high ground that Gavin is setting up on. If Dan was truly a there's an argument that could be made about why Gavin could have felt justified in turning a gun onto him. If Risa was aware of this targeted violence towards Gavin and did nothing, even encouraging it as Gavin implied, there could be an argument made there too. But for his two little brothers, there is no compelling argument. They were children, and Gavin still sits atop his throne of delusion that this wasn't because he picked up a gun and pulled a trigger at four people's heads. It's all because of Dan. At the end of this interview, we'll cover the shocking evidence that supports or contradicts Gavin's claims. So bad. Are you for sure you didn't cut nobody? Yeah, I'm for sure I didn't cut anybody. You just shot everybody? Yeah. Well, James has a cut on his throat. It's because me and him was playing with toys. Okay. And James didn't pay attention. And when his toys had a shop in it, it his throat is open. Yeah. But not the. Can you show me where, where you shot him up? I shot Dan right there. In the temple? Mm-hmm. Somewhere on the side of his head. I don't remember. It's mm-hmm. not lower than... It's not lower than his eye. What is it? I thought I saw him somewhere over here. Okay, like right around this area? Yeah. Where did you shoot your mom at? Back of the head. The back? Mm-hmm. Did she wake up whenever you shot Dan? Mm-hmm. What about Cage? Where did you shoot him at? Back of the head. What about Jameson? Same area. Were they... Were they all in bed when you did this, or? No. Mom and Dan was in bed. Mm-hmm. Gage was, Gage went into their room. I shot oh. him in the back of bed. Jameson was in my room. Well, in mine and his. Because you take care of Jameson all the time? All the time. When you shot Dan and your mother, did uh, Gage wake up and come to that room because maybe... No, he was awake. Oh, he heard the shots, but he didn't know what it was. Okay. So you're in their room after you shoot Dan and your mother. Gage walks in. Gage walks in, I shot him. In the back of the head. In the back of the head. How did you manage to shoot him in the back of the head? Because, I mean, I'm assuming he walked in and seen you. He, he didn't see me right in the room because after that, Jameson needed his drink and I gave him his drink. Gage went to check out what that was. He went to the room, saw them, and I shot him. Did you come up like behind him? I came up behind him. Okay. So while you were giving Jameson a drink, 
you went back to your mom, your mom and dad, your mom and dad's room. And shot Gage. Yeah, Gage was in there looking. I guess to see what it was, and he shot him in the back of the head. Oh, we it. So J- Jameson is shot in your room, or in mine? Hits one. Very yeah, quick. Hits one. Yeah. I mean, I was. So, did he go back to sleep after you gave him a drink, or was he up for the evening? He was up. Was he in his bed, under the bed? He was on the. He was walking around on the ground. Oh, he's walking around. Okay. I mean, now we grab shit him. And while he was walking around, you just shot him in the back of the head as well. Where did his body land, do you remember? I didn't pay attention. I didn't pay attention at all. Because I thought it was what I said, I panicked. Not when it... Did you immediately leave the house after you... I wanted to kill myself. I felt like so I did. Mm-hmm. But I didn't do it because my dad, I didn't kill myself because I promised way back I wouldn't. Yes, he needed me. Who I thought that she's been going on in my life. Mm-hmm. So after you after you shot everyone, did you did you or did you leave your house like as soon as it happened or? Because I panic. Yeah. Did you walk to Rebecca's? No, I went my bike now. You rode your bike? Your bicycle or what? My bike. Yeah, I don't know. Was it a bicycle or was it like a bike motorized? Bicycle. I, I didn't know if it was motorized or something. No, I went That's a long know. way to ride your bike, buddy. Yeah. I just put it so much. What, do you know which door you exited? Your house after you left? The front door. The front door you didn't, those big glass screen where you didn't exit those ones? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the middle of it is glass, mm-hmm. but the other around it isn't. Oh, okay. Was your bike inside or outside the house? Outside. Outside. I just hope that is it. I know you did. I mean, if then this would have happened, then it was me and all that. You think that's still be alive? Yeah, they would be definitely not. And you know, I talked to Rebecca, I told Rebecca, all right, what that Dan did to me. Then try to stuff, make me something and all that. And she's like, you need to get out of there, you need to come here, what did you say? I said, this last thing I need is killed. Because Dan, like I said, he did point that gun to my head. Wow. Mm-hmm. And I tell her, okay, about it. And she's like, if you don't get out of you will be dead. Gavin drops breadcrumbs that Rebecca's words were effective in pulling Gavin towards certain conclusions, but at the same time keeps omitting certain details. While Gavin has consistently made mistakes, been willfully deceptive, and accidentally implicated Rebecca, there are certain pieces of the puzzle that Gavin is, with no question, keeping secret. We will soon learn how Rebecca had greater influence over Gavin than either she or Gavin himself realized. And I'm not sure if you weren't aware of this or not, but after you shot everyone, did did you place that gun? Where did you place that I'll gun? I put it back in the chest. Huh? Right where you got it from. Yeah. Okay. Because I panicked. Well, I just didn't know what to do with it. Um, do you mind to write down all your social media accounts? Oh. I mean, I don't get on Instagram anymore. But I'll give it to you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Your Snapchat chat is Demon Child. Cat. What is K? K A T? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to light on that thing off? No. Shadow Panther 1987 for Instagram. Yes. And then 3900959829582. 
So, Gavin, you said we're at, I just want to make sure I understand, we're at on everybody's, like, where did you shoot Dan on his body? His head. The front or the back? Uh, side. The side? Side. Mom, back, elbow, it's the back of the head. So you shot Dan in the side of the head. You remember which side? No, I did not. Okay. I don't know which side. You shot Mom in the back of the head? Mm -hmm. What was Mom doing when you shot her? Sleep. She was asleep on her, was she laying on her front? Or? Uh, yeah, she just went on the front. How was Dan laying? On, on his side. On his side. What about Gavin? Uh, Gage. Gage, I'm sorry. Uh, he was standing up. Standing when, up? When I shot him. What was he doing? Checking on Gus gun sound at the gun sound okay so where was he standing at the door huh at the door at the door um how far away were you from dan and your mom when you shot him at the end of the bed okay so you're at the end of the bed it's like the how how's the bed set up is it like against it's the like wall? this table it's straight the okay. bed straight okay i just like that so were you at like their feet or their their, feet. their head or feet? Okay. And where was Gage? Uh, he was at the door. Okay. And then where were you standing when you shot Gage? Behind. Huh? Behind him. Behind him. So he walked into the room. Yeah, and I shot him. You shot him in the back of the head. Okay. Did he see you? Mm mm. He never saw you. No. Tell him what you told me when he was going. Like, you know, you had walked in to give Jameson the room? Yeah. He, he walked to give Jameson the drink. By that time, Gage walked in the room to see what happened. And you went up behind him and shot him? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Did, you, did you only shoot everyone just once? Or was there multiple times? Or? I shot everybody once. Once? Mm hmm Okay. And you shot Jameson where at on his head? Back of the head. Okay. Where was he? Uh, the side of my bed. Beside your bed? Yeah, because I, my bed is in front of the hallway. If you walk through that, you'll see it. And his bed's in the side of him, his crib. Okay. I just... So was he, was he out of his crib, or was he... He was walking around on the ground. Okay. And you shot him in the back of the head? Okay. So did you cut... Did... did no. Uh, Jameson's throat get cut at all? No, not from the knife. Me, like I said, me and James was playing with a toy, yeah. and when his toys were sharp, when the edges of it, it sliced and started to hit. Okay. When was that? A couple of days ago. Gavin hits a new personal best with the investigators, telling them exactly what had happened where, to who, and in what manner. Again, when the topic of Jameson's bladed injuries comes up, Gavin is unable to admit to the terrible truth. Things and cuttings are much more personal than using a firearm, and it's clear that Gavin is disgusted with what he has done. The detectives are aware of this fact as well, and know that all the evidence points to Gavin being the one behind the injuries, but the more that they can directly get Gavin to confess to, regardless of how much they already have, it will always result in a stronger case. I think what he was getting at, did you ever once use that knife on anyone? Just, yeah. No, I mean, I touched a knife, but... Right. Okay. I know you never cut no. Mm -hmm. right? no you so. just use the gun. Yes. Okay. Did you? Had you already packed clothes to no. leave before? No, sir. So, so, so after all this is done, after you kill everybody, what what what's going through your head then? I panicked. Okay. Because I realized what I did. Okay. And I wanted to kill myself, but I fought against it. Because I promise with that guy, I wouldn't do it since she's had so much going on. Did you call Rebecca and tell you after you after you did it, or let her know that you did it? I told her what I did. When did you tell her that? That same day I shot them. While Gavin continues to unknowingly implicate Rebecca in having a role in the murders at this point, there's something that he only briefly mentioned before, which investigators would learn the full importance and the haunting reality of when gathering the digital forensics surrounding Gavin and Rebecca's communications. When Gavin first told the investigators about what happened after shooting Dan and Risa, but before shooting Gage, he says that he called Rebecca. While it is true that Gavin and Rebecca spoke together after Dan and Risa were shot, what Gavin fails to mention is that he and Rebecca were on a video call before, during, and after everyone was killed. 
Remember, Rebecca was charged with four counts of first-degree murder, the same homicide charges as Gavin. We'll find out the full scope of Rebecca's involvement after Gavin's interrogation comes to a close. How did you, how did you tell her? Uh, did I did an iPad on Giggle, uh, Giggle Meet on Google Duo. It's one of those, but I know it's a fact that it's Google Meet. Google Meet? Google Meet, yes. Where's the iPad that you were using? On the couch. Okay. Was it like your school iPad, or you told her on your school iPad? Yeah. Okay. Did you take anything with you, like cell phone, iPad, tablet, no, so. anything with you? No. How did you get to Rebecca's house? Well, I went to her house before, and it just, I have a memory. Okay. Memorized. Did, did you walk there, drive I'll there? load my bicycle down. Okay. Did you pack clothes? No, so. You didn't take any clothes with you? Mm-mm. Just these I had on. I had jeans on, like I said, but they had a big hole in it and not doing those way, but they didn't have anything on it. What else were you wearing? These. Shorts? Shorts, except my pants was over my shorts. Okay. About your shoes? Same shoes. Okay. What kind of uh, shirt did you have on? Yes. That t-shirt? Mm-hmm. Did you have anything up on every top of it? Ah, uh, yeah, honey, but that's it. That's when it. you shot? Yeah, when I it. shot them, but... You had a hoodie on when you shot them? Yeah, but I don't know where the hoodie went. Okay. Did you what? maybe leave it at Rebecca's? No, I took it off this time. I need to go? Yeah. Well, there... So, I was when I was outside talking to some other investigators there, were there some other clothes? Yeah, my clothes were on my dresser before I left. I didn't pack them down. What was it? I said some of my clothes was on top of my dress off, but I didn't pack them. Okay. What about at Rebecca's house? Did you have some clothes hidden somewhere in her house? No. This is the clothes I had on. Okay. Besides my jeans. Okay. What about your sweatshirt? I got rid of that. Okay. Was there like a bandana or something? Yeah, a bandana because I don't want to catch this COVID. Okay. So it's like your COVID bandana? Yeah. That's about it. That's only that was my COVID bandana. At? At house. At Rebecca's? Yes. So you had your bandana for COVID? Yeah. You had a protection, you know, face mask type deal? And that's about it. And you had a pair of jeans? Yeah. And you had a sweatshirt? Where did you get rid of that sweatshirt at? Um, I don't really remember the area, but it was on the road somewhere. Oh, you left it on the road somewhere? Yeah. Okay. Did the... So tell me about the gun. Did the gun jam or anything mm -mm. at any point? No, no, so. Okay. It's one of those guns where, like a police gun, you can just shoot, you die in the constant pull back. Okay. But it never, like, mm -mm, jammed no. on you or anything? You never had to mess with it to get it to fire again? No, so. Okay. Evidence photos show the recently fired pistol that was placed back into Dan's dresser. There is a shell casing stuck in the extractor mechanism, which is an indicator of a few different things that both investigators and prosecutors would take into account. One, the gun was fired recently. Two, the gun was fired by someone either without the knowledge or the strength to hold the gun properly, causing the gun to fail to eject the shell casing properly and therefore become jammed. And three, the gun was put back in a hurried or frenzied manner because the shell casing was left stuck in the extractor. So if if I'm just trying to understand all this now, I get it on like on maybe on like some of the physical stuff, but I, what I'm having a hard time understanding here, Gavin, is why you know your Dan had been with your mom for years, you know, yeah. four plus years, um, and I get he was probably an asshole and he's probably a jerk, but I don't understand because I work a lot of these tough cases, and I just don't understand how he's there with you all for four years and then all of a sudden September to November he starts trying she, to make suck his dick. Not she. He he would do it when she's not alone. Well I understand that, but it's just I'm having a I'm not saying that he wasn't a jerk. He wasn't an asshole and he wasn't maybe physically and maybe verbally abusive to you. But I'm having a hard time believing the the sexual part of it. Does that make sense? Yes, sir, I understand. I'm, I'm just having a hard time it's grabbing hard on. to explain, but those are the ones that he did it. Well, are you telling a are you telling a lie? Or are you telling the truth about telling that part? I want to believe everything you're telling me, but that's just not making. I had no 
Light to night to a cop. Trying to tell the truth. Well, I understand, you know, when people do things like this, they want to try to search themselves for a reason because they're ashamed of what they did. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I mean, you, um, for whatever was going on through your head, um, I you, you, you plan to kill your whole family. And a lot of times people look for, they're, oh. they're ashamed of what they did, so they look for something else to, yeah. to blame it on. Um, so is that what's happening here? No, I'm not blaming on anything because I know what I did and it's messed up. I would blame everything I did. Okay. I don't go blame it on other people. Okay. I'm not that type of person. Gavin isn't the type of person to blame anyone, he says. But once again, less than 20 minutes earlier, Gavin said, if Dan didn't do all this to me, none of this would have happened. By this point, Gavin's ineptitude is wearing the investigator's patience thin, and they concede on the idea that Dan might have been physically, verbally, and emotionally abusive, but Gavin's allegations of sexual abuse just don't coalesce into a cohesive story. Remember, these are detectives who, as they mentioned in the beginning, deal with cases that involve the worst of the worst. From their experience, what Gavin is saying doesn't fall in line with what they have experienced over the years. That doesn't mean what Gavin is saying isn't potentially true, even though it actually isn't true. It's just that his story, his behavior, his words, all of it, don't fit the narrative of someone telling the truth. But you never did suck. No, no, so did not. Okay. Mm -mm. Okay. I just want to make sure. I mean, I, I can kind of see that, you know, if you've sent pictures of the bruising, but, you know, it seems like you've told Rebecca everything for the most part, but yes. you didn't tell her about him trying to make you suck his dick. Yes, I have. You did tell her that? Mm -hmm. I told her everything he's ever done to me. You did tell Rebecca that? Yes, everything that he's done to me. Okay. What were you thinking whenever you were shooting your family. I wasn't thinking of straight when I shot them, but after I shot them, I realized how much, what I did. Because I got so depressed and I started crying. Okay. And then I wanted to kill myself, but then I thought against it. Have you showered and took a bath since all this happened? No. Um, I have it. Yeah. Okay. What's those bruises on your neck, bro? Way back again, my hickey. <laughs> <laughs> I know this. <laughs> because she was just trying to get my mind off of her. What did she say to you about all this? She realized what I did. And she told me I shouldn't have done it, but she said that if you didn't do that, your dad, would, your stepdad would probably kill you. When did Rebecca give you the sickies? Huh? When did Rebecca give you the sickies? Last night. Last night? Yeah. <laughs> Last night and this morning. Okay. Was there a knife in your bedroom? No. There was a knife that I told you that I touched and I put it on the hallway shelf. There's never a knife in my room. You got the knife from the kitchen, is what you From said. the kitchen, yes. So did you, I'm assuming you attended on using that knife? Is that why you got it? Yeah, on myself after I done that thing, but I fought against it. Okay. I just put the knife back on the shelf. Okay. <clears throat> did you ever tell Buster about the band trying to suck the Ah, uh, you made me suck him. Yeah. No, I did not. I didn't tell Buster or anything. You didn't? No. I mean, the last thing I need is him to because he's at old age and... Mm -hmm. Okay. So, your mom and Dan, were they awake or sleeping? You shot sleeping. Sleep. So, what time of day was this? It was daytime, but I don't know what time. Was it like first thing in the morning or was it later in the day? No, in the day. That's all I could say. Why were they sleeping? That's all they do. Is they sleep during the day and stay up all night. Do they work anywhere? Mm, mm no. Dan hasn't walked for a couple of years. Mom hasn't walked since Dan and got together. At trial, Risa's father, Timothy Saunders, would tell the court that Risa hadn't been employed since she was 18. 
She held no job for nearly 21 years, and Dan's only income was from disability. Have you ever seen him use, like, alcohol or drugs or anything like that? Dan, he, if you check the fridge, there's alcohol now. He used to drink out at the time. Was he able to get drunk? Yeah. No drugs, though? No drugs, though. Do you drink or use drugs? No, so. I'm not into that stuff. You said your dad's been out of the picture for a while? He's been out of the picture since I was one years old. When's the last time you talked to him? I actually never talked to him. Do you know where he is or how to get a hold of him or anything? Oh, I know the last time I heard was from uh, Busta. Is he said that my dad is in Beckley, but I don't know if that's the well. You even know his name? Uh, I do know his name, but I forgot it. Okay. No. I don't know Well, I'm going to go check back. There are other guys who play anything else. Thank you very much. All right, so. We got Are there any other uh, social media accounts or anything else? Mm -hmm. no, that's the only one. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Get your belly full, buddy. Yeah. Huh? Yes. You want some of these Wendy's fries? I know you don't like them, but. No, I'm fine. You sure? I haven't ate mine. You want anything else to eat or drink? No, sir. Okay. So I don't even drink half my food. Okay. We've got a few more questions to ask you. Is that okay? Yeah, I okay. How do you How do you get a hold of Buster? Is he the one that lives on Elk River Road? Yes. Okay. How do you get a hold of him? Do you have a number for him or anything? I have his number in my head. But he doesn't know that it is. Would you mind writing that down? Yes. I haven't had contact with him since they put the restraint on it against him for going down the Okay. Um, and do you know who Gage's father is? Yeah, but he's actually out one of the cops. Like, he has state troopers on him after him. Oh, so you mean he's wanted by the police? So yes. Doing. Okay, do you know his name by chance? Wick. Well, Wetchard. Richard? Wetchard. What last name? Wickley. Richard Ripley? Wickley. Yeah, Wait, like Jackson that. County Wickley. Really? Okay. Yes. But uh, he hasn't been engaged his life for the years. Well, no one's died for the years. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just assuming Jameson is Dan and your mother's child, correct? Yes. Okay. So you you engage have had different fathers along. Okay. Yeah. But Dan is Jameson's dad. Yeah, I remember my dad's name, Jerry Smith. Jerry Smith is your J E R O I. Okay. And you I, said he he's from Beckley area, you think? I think. Unless that's what Bud uh Buster thought, man. Want another chicken nugget? No, I'm fine, sure. yes. Hey, Chelsea, you should eat. <laughs> you should eat. Oh, no. Withering away or nothing. <laughs> now, we've been talking to our other detectives up at your, your house. Mm -hmm. That happened. And they told us that uh, Jameson's body is kind of, you know, oddly placed. It mm -hmm. like, did you, did you maybe move his body by chance? No, I shot him. I didn't pay attention to where he fell. Did you maybe cover him up with anything? No. Because they're saying that there's some sort of like blanket over him. I wouldn't have seen how that would 
get there unless maybe you place me on it. I might have actually moved the blanket. It's okay if you did. We, we were just curious how it got there. Do you, you think you did? I it? probably accidentally moved it. Okay. How it, would you actually? It was on the edge of the bed, like half of the blanket. Mm -hmm. And if you touch it, it'll fall over. Okay. So, so I might have actually touched it and fell on top of them. Okay. And they say, you know, half the, it seems like you know, the upper part of his body is kind of underneath the bed or. We will never truly know what actually transpired because the only party left alive, Gavin, up until his trial and beyond, never fully admitted to the haunting truths of his depraved actions. We can draw our own conclusions based on the evidence and testimony, but it being verifiably factual just won't ever happen until Gavin decides to take responsibility for his actions. Jameson was halfway under the bed. Why? because Jameson was trying to hide from the horrible sounds of agonal respiration from his family and the ear-piercing sounds of 40 caliber rounds being fired in the small home that Jameson shared with his family. Jameson was trying to hide from his brother Gavin, the one that he called Daddy. Jameson was trying to hide because Jameson was terrified. Jameson was screaming because of Gavin. Jameson died because of Gavin. And Gavin covered Jameson's body with a blanket because he couldn't bear the sight of little Jameson laying lifeless by his own hands. He couldn't handle the smell of the iron in the air, choking on its thickness from the blood of his family spreading throughout the home. No matter what he says, no matter who he tries to blame, no matter who said what or did what, it's Gavin and Gavin alone that picked up that gun and pulled the trigger. That is what happened to Jameson. Does he have a crib, or you guys sleep in the same bed, or how's uh, it work? He has a crib, okay. but he won't sleep in it if we slept together. Okay. So, do you know if maybe his head was up underneath? No, he was standing up. He was extremely close to the bed when I shot him. Okay. I didn't pay attention to what he fell. But did did you lay that blanket over top of him, or? I might have actually knocked it so, onto him. So, after you shot him? Yeah, after I shot him. Were you like trying to cover him up? Mm-mm. No. It's okay if you were. We were just getting to the bottom of it, you know. It would be kind of hard to look at, man. We understand that. We're just trying to understand why he was found a certain way. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. I understand. I mean, I didn't pay attention where his body dropped was after I shot him. I well as what I did. You, and you, you did not move the body. You just I did not move anybody. You shot him. He just he fell where he fell. Yes. And you did, are you saying you did put that blanket over top of it? I did not, but I might have actually touched it when, when I wasn't paying attention. How how far away from you were you, were you from Jameson when you did shoot him? I mean, were you like in your doorway or were you really close to him when you did? Oh, I saw his clip when I shot him. Okay, so you were you were all the way in the room with him. Yeah. You call it a crib? Is it like an actual crib? Or it's an actual crib. It is. So it's a crib. Place? We had to lift the baby up out of it. What does it look like? It's brown. Is it wooden or nice wooden? Thing? And uh, underneath the mattress is a metal spring. Okay. And you said you sleep in that same room. Mm-hmm. That's your bedroom too. Yeah. Where's your bed? In there? Well, my bed's like down the hallway. My original room is in the basement, but that's a storage room now. So where do you sleep? Uh, on that bed where James' body's found. Because as soon as you walk down the light, light down the hallway, you'll see it's right there in the bed. It's the same way just hey boys. So you have a room in the same room that Jameson I sleeps in? I basically sleep with Jameson in his own room. Okay. Where do you keep all your clothes and stuff? In my dresser. Where's that at? Right beside the bed. In Jameson, in the room? In Jameson's one. Okay, so that's where you sleep. All my stuff is in Jameson's one with this. Okay, and that's where you sleep? Mm-hmm. Okay. I just sleep right there and all this so much. How was uh, your butt buster related to you? Is that uh, your mom's dad? Or? Uh, well, my grandpa yeah. had my mom, and I'm guessing buster is her great-grandfather. Okay, so your, your grandfather's name is... He's the one that lives in Ripley, right? Yeah. His name's Timmy Saunders? Timothy. Okay. Yeah. And that's his, Buster is his father. Yes. Is that what you're yes. Okay, I understand. Anything else? Buddy, <laughs> Gavin, is there anything else we didn't ask you about that you think is important that we need to know? No. 
Anything you want to say to us? or? Yeah, I'm sorry for wasting your guys' time. But it's not a waste of our time. It's a serious thing. And we appreciate you being honest with us and we talking do. with us. We do. It goes a long way. Yeah. I mean, I'm always honest with cops. Yeah. I mean, you said that to me on the way down, and mm -hmm. you know, I didn't have it several times. So. These are the words of a police officer whose exhaustion has reached its peak. Gavin repeats one of his laughable attempts to come across as truthful, that he, quote, has no right to lie to cops, and that he's always honest is met with the detective's acknowledgement that Gavin has said that already, multiple times, in multiple locations. Anyone else could pick up on the frustration veiled behind these words, but Gavin, Gavin seems to have no idea that his words are building nothing more than a nearly airtight case against him. It's an awful, awful thing, buddy. Yeah. You sure we can't get you anything else? Yeah. We got a guy out there. He's got a whole drawer full of chips. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you like Doritos? Yeah, no, I'm fine. Fine, I'm yes. sure. okay. Well, we'll be back in a second. You need to use a bathroom or anything? Mm-hmm. You good? Uh, we'll check it on your hair and see what's up. Okay. Get my trash out of here. You done with that? Uh, yeah. I just can't wait to fight.
Gavin asks about the family dog, Gemma, and what would happen to her. Most people can identify with caring about a pet's well-being. It's totally understandable, but where was this care for life when Gavin was executing his family? Is Gavin mentioning the dog to show how compassionate he is? Or is Gavin's concern for human life that little that his preoccupying thought is his dog, which he likely doesn't realize, either willfully or not, he will never see again? All right, I'll go check on the dog for you. All right. Uh, I need to go to the bathroom. I didn't wear it. I didn't wear it. Yeah, I'll walk you to the bathroom. Cool. Following this interrogation, Gavin Smith will be booked into the Kanawha County Jail after being charged with four counts of first-degree murder and four counts of using a firearm during the commission of a felony. Rebecca Walker, Gavin's girlfriend, will be charged with four counts of first-degree murder as well. The extent of Rebecca's involvement was understated to say the least during Gavin's interview. Gavin's statement of having told her his plans was enough to implicate her, at minimum, as an accomplice. Gavin would tell investigators that she behooved him to find a way out of the house that it wasn't safe, and horrifyingly ironically, that he needed to leave before things escalated to the point where someone would lose their life. Both Rebecca and Gavin's family disapproved of their relationship, and seeing how the relationship was affecting them would not allow them to spend time with one another. Gavin's home life, in truth, was not a shining example of a healthy environment. The home was extremely dirty, and Gavin was, indeed, required to do well beyond what a 16-year-old boy normally would be, namely becoming the primary caretaker for Jameson. Gavin would portray Dan as someone who was extremely cruel and at times violent towards him, and Reese's father, Timothy Saunders, who was also the family member who discovered the bodies, would state during the trial that Dan was known to, quote, bark orders, and even confirm that Gavin could indeed be considered Jameson's primary caretaker. However, Saunders also stated that Risa put her sons first and was a good mother, and that the boys could eat so much that locks were necessary to have enough food for the month, adding that the children were far from being malnourished. In addition, there was no evidence to support any of Gavin's extreme claims, which were reported and confirmed by true crime creator Just Interrogations. Nothing's ever black and white, I admit. And there are some animal parents out there who've done even worse things to their kids. And victims of abuse don't fit into any one particular mold as far as how they express what happened and how they decide to deal with it. So I reached out to the police department who handled Gavin's case to ask if during their investigation they found anything to indicate Gavin was being abused. And according to them, they didn't. There was no evidence that Gavin or his siblings had ever been abused. The closest thing they found was that his parents would sometimes put a lock on the refrigerator to stop Gavin from overeating. And while you may not agree with that particular form of parenting, that's a pretty far cry from repeatedly punching your child in the groin. Gavin's relationship with Rebecca was, in all likelihood, shot down by his family for selfish reasons. It's also significant to mention that pandemic quarantines were still very much a thing during this period, late 2020, and combined with a filthy environment, doing things he really shouldn't have to be doing, having responsibility for his three-year-old brother while the mother and father slept throughout the day, restricted access to food, and was prevented from communicating with the one person he truly wanted to, it's understandable why Gavin was upset. On Rebecca's side, her father began to lose favor with Gavin when he noticed that Gavin would be around much more than he was comfortable with, notably after Gavin had mentioned wanting to have children with Rebecca. 
After one incident in particular, Gavin refused to leave Rebecca's house after being told that Rebecca needed to go to a doctor's appointment. Rebecca was then barred from seeing Gavin any further. Sadly, Rebecca's mother passed away in November of that year, and in the interim, she was to stay at her grandmother's house. It wasn't until the week of December 9th that the entire situation reached its boiling point. Rebecca's grandmother was scheduled to leave for a few days on December 10th. Both teens, eager to spend an extended period of time alone, wallowed in their unfortunate circumstances until Gavin came up with a plan. Rebecca would be home alone, but he couldn't leave because of Dan and Risa. But what if Dan and Risa weren't able to tell him no? A few days before December 9th, the plan was hatched. Gavin would kill Dan and Risa to finally be free from their grasp in exchange for Rebecca's warm embrace. On the day of, Gavin would show Rebecca the gun and the knife he intended to use over a video call. Rebecca had entire days prior to either contact the authorities or at least defuse the situation, but instead, Rebecca would encourage Gavin to follow through. With the video call still connected, she would message him, hurry up and do it, and get it over with. His resolve strengthened by her words, Gavin went forward with his plan. Rebecca would testify that the screen went black, and moments later, gunshots erupted. Gavin would soon reappear, looking very panicked, nervous, and scared. While trying to calm Gavin down, in the background, Rebecca could hear Jameson crying. She would tell the court that she didn't want the baby to suffer the same fate, but Gavin had other ideas. They ended the video call so that Gavin could use Dan's phone instead. Moments later, a message from Gavin appeared. Gavin, okay baby, I'm a murderer. Gavin, I killed Jameson. I'm crying. Rebecca, I heard him crying. Gavin, I shot him. Injuries to Jameson's neck and forensics confirmed that Gavin had indeed used the knife in question, but likely due to the much more raw and personal method of homicide via bladed weapon compared to a firearm, Gavin aborted his plan after a few seconds and went to retrieve the gun. During this time, Jameson, terrified, tried to escape by hiding under his bed. The person who had cared for him for years now causing unbearable pain, and without question, Jameson was unable to understand why this was happening, or what was about to happen. He only made it halfway under the bed by the time Gavin returned to Jameson's room, firing one final time, silencing sweet Jameson forever. Evidence shows that Gavin was likely deeply disturbed by his own actions. The gun's failure to extract the shell casing was almost undoubtedly caused by holding the gun limply. Combined with his message to Rebecca, I'm crying, the evidence shows that Gavin, at least somewhat, was having doubts about Jameson. But he still did it. Jameson's body was found covered with purpose by one of his blankets. Gavin couldn't bear witness to the evil he had unleashed on an innocent child, his baby brother. Gavin would put Dan's gun back in the dresser and the knife on the shelf before getting on his bicycle to head towards Rebecca's grandmother's house. He would take refuge in a wooded area nearby until he could sneak into her room at night, waiting for her grandmother to leave in the morning. Rebecca would try to give Gavin safe harbor, giving him the affection and attention that he craved so desperately. She would lie to the police when questioned about his whereabouts, even giving him an area behind her dresser that he could hide if he needed to the same hiding area that police found him three days later. At 10.40 a.m. on December 13th, Timothy Saunders, Reese's father and Gavin's grandfather, would enter the home after not being able to reach the family the last few days, having last heard from them on December 8th. Having been locked inside for five days by this point, the family dog, Gemma, had left urine and feces everywhere, the first sign that something was wrong. Timothy called out but received no answers. He walked to the master bedroom and saw that Dan and Risa were in bed. He called out, but again, no answer. Attempting to open the door, he hit something. The horrors inside of the home on Cemetery Hill were coming to light. His 12-year-old grandson, Gage, laid lifeless on the floor. Timothy moved to the bed and grabbed his daughter's foot, shaking it, desperately hoping for a response, but there was none. They too had been mercilessly executed. He searched for the other two boys, Gavin and Jameson, but could not find them. It wasn't until later that Jameson's body was found under his bed and Gavin nowhere in sight. Only hours later, Gavin would be apprehended at that hiding spot in Rebecca's grandmother's house, brought in for questioning, and then formally charged. At trial, it was never a question of if Gavin did it or not, 
The argument was if there was malice or intentional motive, the prosecution looked to Rebecca Walker to testify against Gavin and in order to do so offered her a plea bargain. Instead of taking four counts of first degree murder to trial in exchange for her testimony against Gavin, Rebecca would plead guilty to accessory to first degree murder for which she would receive a 10 year prison sentence in total. After how actively Rebecca encouraged Gavin, why would she receive such a lenient sentence? The answer is that without Rebecca, there are four dead bodies and a person who did it, but they have no provable motive. Rebecca was the primary witness. Rebecca not only could provide the motive, but was the motive. Rebecca was the one who gave statements on why Gavin did it, and Rebecca was the only one who could testify to that. The only communications Gavin had during the planning, the only communications after, Rebecca was the only other person. Without Rebecca, you only had a trail of two people talking, and the only other person, Gavin, didn't take the stand during his trial. The prosecution believed that without Rebecca, there was not enough to successfully convince the jury to return a guilty verdict on the first degree murder charges. The trial for Gavin, from beginning to verdict, took less than four days, with the jury taking less than five hours total to deliberate. He was found guilty on one count of use of firearm during the commission of a felony. Both the prosecution and defense agreed to drop the other three duplicate charges for simplification. For this charge, Gavin was sentenced to 10 years in prison. For Gage's death, Gavin was found guilty of second degree murder. The reasoning behind the downgrade from first degree to second degree was the lack of intent. Gage was shot in Dan and Reese's room, somewhere that he wasn't supposed to be. Gavin's intent to shoot Gage was never discussed with Rebecca, and ultimately, there was not evidence that Gavin shot Gage because he wanted to. Gavin shot Gage because he felt that he had to. It was in reaction to him unexpectedly coming in. For this charge, Gavin was sentenced to 40 years in prison. The jury returned three guilty verdicts for the remaining three counts of first-degree murder for Dan, Risa, and Jameson. The intent to kill Dan and Risa was obvious since it was planned, and while Jameson was not part of the plan, evidence and testimony proved that Gavin had intent to kill him. Gavin intentionally left the video call with Rebecca after hearing him cry for the purpose of killing him. For each of these charges, Gavin received life with mercy. In the state of West Virginia, the law mandates that juveniles cannot be sentenced to life without parole or life with no mercy. Gavin was legally an adult at the age of 18 at the time of sentencing, but he was a minor at the time that the offenses were committed. Gavin Smith will be eligible for parole 15 years after first being placed into custody, December 13, 2035. However, Gavin Smith was also sentenced to serve each sentence consecutively, one after another. While the law mandates that Gavin be considered for parole, there is no obligation for a parole board to grant him that leniency. It is likely that given the circumstances surrounding Gavin's terrible crimes, he will never be released. The hell unleashed by Gavin on his family inside of their home on Cemetery Hill Drive was aptly summarized by Kanawha County Circuit Judge Kenneth Ballard during sentencing. Executed your mother and stepfather by shooting them in the head while they were asleep. Then you executed your two brothers by shooting them in the head, the youngest which was hiding under his crib. Your actions can only be described as an act of pure evil. Evil. I find that you have zero remorse for your actions. And in fact, the probation officer reports that he felt that, he felt in your, that you were justified in your actions. Rebecca Walker was transferred from the Kanawha County Jail to the Lakin Correctional Center in West Columbia, West Virginia on March 25, 2022. She became eligible for parole on June 15, 2023. If she is not granted parole and does not acquire any new charges while incarcerated, she is scheduled to be released on December 15, 2025. Gavin Smith was transferred from the Kanawha County Jail into the West Virginia Department of Correction System on January 24, 2023. He has no projected release date. He remains incarcerated at the Mount Olive Correctional Complex in Mount Olive, West Virginia, where he will likely remain for the rest of his life.